Today's program, uh, firstly, my name is Shabir Razvi. I'll be a host for this evening. And today's program, as usual, is organized by Open Discussion in association with Gulf Cultural Club. The two individuals whom I must name all the time is Dr. Saeed Shahabi and Fatima Dosa, because without whom these programs would not take place. And obviously, um, for all of you to be here as well. Today, as usual, every year for the last, I would say, 34 years, we've been holding this function, certainly not at this centre, but at many locations in London. This is the 34th anniversary of the Islamic Revolution in Iran. And, you know, as a somewhat of a younger person, I would say it was really blessed to be alive at the dawn of that revolution. And it feels like an extended dawn. Um, and things have been happening incredibly rapidly um, insofar as Iran is concerned and the geopolitical situation, the way it's developing. We have three eminent scholars and academics who will be presenting um, their talk today. As usual, um, each of them will present for about 20 minutes each and then we have a Q&A, after which uh, please join us for um, a lovely meal. In in the opening, what I would say, just to set the scene today, is Alama Iqbal, a very prominent poet from South Asia who wrote immensely in Farsi. And he said an extraordinary thing in 1919, at the time the League of Nations was founded by the US President Woodrow Wilson. And he said, if Tehran becomes the Geneva of the Eastern countries, maybe the destiny of the earth will be changed. And I think last year, perhaps we can see what's happening with America, with uh, uh, Iran taking the presidency of Nam for the next three years. So certainly maybe the pivotal city for the next three years as to what happens globally, maybe Tehran. So um, 100 years later, maybe Iqbal's vision is perhaps coming true to a degree. What is also important to remember is that a lot has been achieved in the last 34 years and really um, the media, the press and everyone shies away about talking about the achievements that Iran has uh, sort of accomplished in the last 34 years and I'm sure the speakers will also touch on those. So let me not take too much of their time and let me introduce immediately our first speaker Dr. David Patrick Caracas. He's an experienced author, journalist, and producer with a track record in development and production. Worked in a wide range of uh, genres, both visual and written, including documentaries, current affairs, and a specialist factory. He has reported from some of the world's toughest places and, and has an expert knowledge of current affairs and international relations. He's the author of Nuclear Iran. I think we reviewed that in our publication recently. The Birth of an Atomic State. He has worked with the BBC <coughs> News, BBC World, Al Jazeera, Voice of Russia, BBC Radio 4, World Tonight, Radio Scotland, ABC, and so on. I have immense pleasure to introduce David, if you'd be kind enough to make a presentation. Please thank you. Uh, I apologize for the delay. Rather nasty weather we're having, so I hope it doesn't uh, get in the way too much. So I'm going to talk about Iran's nuclear program. I'm going to talk about it in a historical context. This is the subject of my book, and this is how I believe you have to look at it in order to understand it properly. For the last decade, I mean, looking at where we are now to begin with, you know, the West's leading powers in Iran have engaged in the most serious 
diplomatic clash since the run-up to the 2003 Iraq war, and it is escalating. Uh, almost 10 years on from August 2002, when an Iranian opposition group, the MKO, revealed full details of the Iranian enrichment plan in the Tans and a heavy water plant at Iraq in Iran, at Iraq in Iran, the P5 plus 1, that's the five Security Council powers plus Germany, has managed to sanction Iran's oil, isolate the country for the international banking system, and make it an international pariah. Iran, meanwhile, has managed to enrich uranium to around 20%. It runs several thousand centrifuges in the Tans plant, and it has a large stockpile of low enriched uranium. We are at an impasse. More than 30 years after the coming of the Islamic Republic, and 10 years into the nuclear crisis, the question of how to integrate into the international community a country of 70 million people, and among the largest reserves of oil and gas in the world, still remains. And this is a truly global issue. Now, this talk might be slightly different to so many you've heard on the subject. I'm not going to talk about whether Iran is building a bomb or how close it is to one, and I won't discuss sanctions, centrifuges, and enrichment, though we can certainly talk about this in the Q&A if necessary. Rather, I'm going to discuss the program as a whole, and I'm, by which I mean civil nuclear power and any possible weapons program, and try to show what the program has meant to Iran and what it means to Iran over different periods of time why it has meant what it has meant to Iran, and how this has changed over time. Only by understanding this, is, I argue, can you hope to sort of solve the impasse that we're currently at. And I advance a very simple thesis, that the nuclear program offers an opportunity. It is a window into the enigma of modern Iran, the story of which is in several regards the story of Iran's efforts to engage with a specific view of the world as deeply hostile and to negotiate a place within this world. Iran's nuclear program is merely its most ambitious, most ambitious attempt to do this. And its, its story, its history, if you like, is a kind of tabula rasa, a blank slate, onto which modern Iran's evolution has been and continues to be written. If you understand the nuclear program, you understand modern Iran. Understand modern Iran and you have the best chance of resolving the nuclear crisis. So, to begin, briefly at the beginning. The roots of Iran's nuclear program lie not in physics, but in Iranian history, which has created a modern Iranian history, which has created a very specific Iranian view of the world. Now, since the beginning of the 19th century, Iran has suffered the loss of its territories, part of Azerbaijan in 1812, the division of its country into spheres of influence by the British and Russians in 1907, and even the forced abdication of its rulers, Reza Shah in 1941. Even without the trauma of a sustained occupation, it has suffered a meddling of its internal politics that found an inevitable apotheosis in the 1953 Anglo-American coup that overthrew the Iranian Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh, an event that has remained lodged in Iranian consciousness ever since. Now, all of these experiences have created an underlying narrative that Iran is a weak country that must do what it can to protect itself against stronger, more aggressive ones and to achieve some kind of independence uh, or autonomy in a Western, what it sees as a Western-dominated world that is culturally alien and historically hostile. For Iranians, or many Iranians, the country's oil wealth, its geostrategic location, will always make it a target for others. How Iran is to deal with this, or more accurately, how differing ruling elites have sought to deal with this question, has driven the nuclear program, often in totally different directions, for over 50 years. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, nuclear power came to Iran in the 1950s under the previous ruler, the Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. Now, I don't intend to dwell on the Shah's program here, but it makes a good counterpoint to the Islamic republics, which I will discuss at greater length. Suffice it to say that no one had a more visceral understanding of Iran's weakness in the face of foreigners, quote unquote, than the Shah. He had come to power during the 1941 British-Russian invasion of Iran and had only taken the throne when the British and Russians had allowed him to ascend to it and forced his father to flee into exile. So no one desired national strength, national independence more than the Shah. And a nuclear program, something he wanted personally, was one of the means by which he wanted to achieve this. <clears throat> Iran at this time was a developing country, but it had a ruler who wanted to restore it to its former glory for it to become, and this is critical, the equal of his Western role models. Nuclear programs, as 
projects of great sophistication can bring a lot of prestige to developing countries. Technological improvements, increased natural capabilities, even a nuclear power and electric grid can all advance a country and, and can fill what I term a prestige deficit that the, that the Shah suffered from very, very clearly in relation to the West. So for the Shah, the nuclear program was how, along with his lavish spending, his huge arms buying from the US, was how Iran would find its place in the world. It would emulate his Western role models. That was his means by which to do it. And nuclear power, the ultimate in technology, was for him a real conduit to modernity, to, you know, to modernization. But you see, it's what modernization meant to the Shah, because for the Shah, modernization was westernization. <coughs> He even favoured Western powers with nuclear contracts as he attempted to bind Iran to the West through commercial ties. It was not a practical vision, and nor one that the population, who always resented his supposed reliance on the Americans, could share it. In fact, they greatly resented it. So as his, as his reign collapsed, uh, it became one more symptom of his lavish spending, his profligacy, uh, you know, that was bankrupting Iran. And it also contributed to his eventual downfall. Obviously, the Shah was replaced by the Ayatollah Khomeini. Now, during the 1979 Islamic Revolution, uh, crowds walked through the streets carrying banners of Mossadegh, shouting, Mar Bar al Rikar, Death to America. The 1953 coup, already iconic in the national consciousness, was reduced to a single homily about the perfidious role of foreign powers in Iran, especially the US. What this meant was that the nuclear program, Iran's membership, if you like, to the Western club, with all its nuclear facilities being built by the Germans and the French, Western powers, was now seen as an anathema. <coughs> Khomeini saw the world as fundamentally iniquitous, enthralled to the imperial powers that ran it, and he was determined that, to quote him, Iran would be neither dependent on the godless East or the tyrannic blasphemous West, which meant that within a few months, almost all the nuclear projects were unilaterally cancelled. The nuclear program, he declared, was a cause of greater dependence on imperialist countries. It was, in effect, the continuation of colonialism by other means. What was now to be the goal was self-sufficiency, a real, real what byword for the early Islamic Republic and actually enshrined in the Islamic Republic's constitution. By rejecting the nuclear program, the revolutionary government rejected an embodiment of Pahlavi ambition. In effect, it rejected a form of state identity. Now, Excuse me. In the early 1980s, things were quite chaotic for the Islamic Republic. War with Iraq had broken out. So there was quite a lot of chaotic decision making. And the situation actually to cancel the project was soon reversed, about a year later in 1980. It was decided that the sheer amount of money that the Shah had spent on the program, not to mention its possible uses for electricity, meant that logic dictated that it be continued. But the Islamic Republic had problems. Uh, it's kidnapping of diplomats at the U.S. Embassy, in, uh, or the kidnapping of, by a student group of uh, U.S. diplomats during the 1979-1980 hostage crisis meant that Iran had alienated the world, particularly the U.S., and finding nuclear partners, people who would deal with it, was very difficult. The U.S. did everything it could to stop Iran getting nuclear technology that it might use for a bomb, and pressured its allies to do the same. Iran now in turn railed against the great Satan at every opportunity, as far as the Mullahs were concerned, Iran was alone. Alone fighting Iraq, which had used chemical weapons against it while the world stood silently on, I mean its eyes, and alone in its quest for nuclear power. And this historical narrative had seemingly been confirmed by experience. Iran can trust only Iran, was the lesson. Which meant something very strange for the nuclear program. What was once an anathema now morphed into a patriotic duty. Senior regime officials like Ali Akbar Rafsanjani now urged Iranian scientists who had fled abroad during the revolution to return home and serve their country at this difficult time. Now, for the Shah, the nuclear program had been a symbol of an Iran that was Western and inclusive, plugged into the international community, but now it had become a symbol of an entirely different Iran, an Iran that was palpably non-Western and defiant. Its meaning, if you like, had flipped 180 degrees, but the impulse behind it, as an overt expression of Iran's attempt to deal with the modern world, was exactly the same. The Shah had sought greater independence in the world through his, to, his desire to embrace the international community as a similar kind of state. The Islamic Republic 
considered it a means of forcing the West to accept its self-declared otherness, but on an equal footing. And it is this idea that has been at the centre of the programme ever since, and that dominates its nuclear diplomacy today. So if we fast forward almost 20 years to spring 2003, about six to eight months after the MKO revealed full details of the two sides to begin the nuclear crisis. Now, the Iranians were scared. You know, the Islamic Republic had fought a war of words over its program with the US and Israel. For almost 20 years, it had been accused of being a weapons program, and they denied it and denied it. Now it seemed that it might, they might be proved right before a global audience. The Bush administration had just made good on its threats of regime change in Iraq and smashed Saddam. This was remember, you must remember this was before the disaster of the peace. This was just in a couple of months after they had successfully taken out Saddam. Now, Iran's dossier was at the International Atomic Energy Agency, just as Iraq's had been 10, ten years earlier, uh, just, as Iraq, just as Iraq's had been only a few months earlier. If, and it was quite possible, that perhaps the same thing would happen to Iran. So the Americans, they wanted answers. Everyone wanted answers, in fact. So the Iranians had to formulate a position do so quickly and ensure it was effective. And this is where they set out the principles that have guided Iran's modern nuclear diplomacy ever since. Principles that are forged in Iranian history and in Khomeini's worldview. Now, a man called Hassan Rouhani, who you've probably heard of, was given the charge, the Secretary of Iran's Supreme National Security Council, was given the task of handling the nuclear fire. So he had to decide most immediately what they were going to do. Would they scrap the program as Gaddafi would go on to do later on, or would they defend it? And if they defended the program, what exactly were they defending? What did it mean to Iran? So what he decided was that they were going to defend the program. They were not going to cave into pressure. And that fundamental principles would frame all policy. The first of which was that the nuclear program was integral to Iran's security. And it would not be abandoned. And as ever, policy was framed by Iranian perceptions of history, namely the overarching problem between Iran and the West. As Rouhani told his president, Mohammed Khatami, and this is Rouhani now, he said, the authority of the Islamic regime, its national security, and the unification of all its territories have not at any given time during these past 27 years been supported or even recognized by the West in any realistic manner. The determination of this great nation to ensure its stability and to seek independence as justice has never been and never will be welcomed by the West. At no stage after the victory of the Islamic Revolution has the relationship between Iran and the West become normalized. So the Islamic Republic, in its essence, believed it lived in a world where no one had accepted its very existence. In its eyes, its nuclear program was a symptom of this targeted by the Americans and Europe from its very beginnings, who abrogated Iran of promised nuclear fuel back in the 80s, who stopped other suppliers dealing with Iran in order to, in their narrative, keep Iran down. <coughs> the nuclear power plant at Bushehra, this is the power plant Iran has been building for upwards of 30 years, in particular highlighted this trend, this trend of victimization. And Rouhani continued that under three consecutive US presidents, the prevention of its construction dominated Russian-Iranian relations because the Russians were building the program and the, Iranian, the Americans were putting a lot of pressure on them not to build it. Now what this meant, and this is critical, Rouhani argued, was that there was no other option but for Iran to produce this technology within its own borders. And he said, he said the clash between the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Western world will never be resolved until Iran's ability in various political, economic, scientific and technological arenas reaches an equal comparable to that of the West's and a just relationship between us and them becomes inevitable. The belief in Iran's need to face the world from a position of strength would drive nuclear policy. And if the situation was dangerous back then in those months of 2003, it only made the achievement of an indigenous nuclear capability all the more important. To compromise on this would be to compromise on the regime's existence, which was self-evidently unacceptable. Now for the Shah, the world was a stage, and its international institutions an opportunity for him to play upon it. The Islamic Republic, conversely, which views the world with suspicion, and has many hard lines that argue for a national security policy based on the most atavistic elements of Hanayn's worldview. 
This is, what, this is the dialect that goes on inside Iran at the moment. And the, the narrative that they have learned from modern history is that the United States, they believe, so many people believe, want to overthrow the regime. And since the first Gulf War in 1991, has had a huge military presence in the Middle East, with military bases in Saudi Arabia and the UAE, not to mention the Fifth Fleet in Bahrain. 2001's Operation Enduring Freedom saw huge numbers of their American groups gathered on Iran's eastern border in Afghanistan. Saddam's overthrow two years later, despite removing a pressing Iranian security concern, saw yet more US troops massed now on its western border. With US forces also in the CIS republics, Iran has been encircled by the USA on its own continent. The last time I was in Iran, I heard a very bitter joke that Iranians would tell. There are two countries in the world that have only the United States as their border. The other is Canada. So you get a real sense of how they feel. The Iranians are scared, and they want respect. They feel the world is not afforded them their due. As Iran's ambassador to the IAEA, Ali Ashkar Sultanay, told me some years ago in Vienna, we are a nation with 5,000 years of history. The world should not speak to us like animals. The nuclear program is a symptom of these impulses. A civil nuclear program brings a developing country like Iran a prestige to which it is keenly sensitive. It is a shortcut to a much desired modernity and to technological advancement. A nuclear bomb might give them the security they crave. Precedent is important here as well. Following the 9-11 attacks, the US invaded Afghanistan to destroy the Taliban a regime that harboured and supported al-Qaeda. But Islamabad had also harboured and supported al-Qaeda, was a long-standing sponsor of terrorism, and had also spawned the AG Khan network. But Iran was declared a triumvir in the axis of evil, while Colin Powell called Pakistan a major ally in the war on terror. Washington then went on, when, went on to smash Iraq that turned out not to have WMDs. Many in Tehran concluded that Washington treats nuclear weapon states differently. It is these wider fears that are at the heart of today's impasse. The nuclear crisis is not the cause, but the effect of a wider clash between Iran and the West. And it is this underlying relationship that must be addressed for any resolution to be found. Thank you. David, thank you very much. Actually, one minute less than uh, allocated time. Very kind of you. I do appreciate that. Um, i move rapidly to our next speaker, who is Dr. Majid Tafrishi. He's a historian and researcher on current affairs. His field of research include modern Iranian history, history and current UK-Iranian relations, and modern history of the Persian Gulf. He's a specialist on both British archives and unpublished documents and manuscripts. He has many publications relating to Iran, his internal politics, and it its regional role. Please welcome Dr. Majid, please. think uh, uh, um, the lobby of the UK government uh, for Iranians and in, in here, here many people think I'm the lobby of the Iranian government for Iran and uh, I have no problem with them. Yeah, yeah. I have no problem with uh, neither of them but no one pays. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, I like to start with uh, three recent, very recent affairs uh, in the UK relation to show the, how the matter is so sensitive. Uh, talking about the British policies in Iran is not an easy issue. Uh, in the last uh, few weeks, in the last couple of weeks, uh, uh, different things happened uh, that shows the issue is especially sensitive when I talk about the the importance of the issue, the UK running relation, the history and background of that, and the current issue, current affairs. Uh, only two weeks ago, uh, roughly two weeks ago, uh, uh, after 
uh, an introduction which was about a couple of months ago. A famous uh, uh, person, Ahmadinejad's lobby, called Dr. Abdul Zadavari, published an article in one of the Iranian newspapers uh, and web another website and attacked uh, the bro uh, brother of uh, the Motalifa party, which was one of the right-wing uh, uh, rivals of President Ahmadinejad, called Mr. Asadullah Askarulladi. He's one of the richest Iranian businessmen, and uh, also brother of Haibullah Askarulladi, the leader of Motalifa party, and accused him to be uh, in, uh, in connection with British uh, authorities and security service. The source was one of my articles I published about 30 years ago. I, every year I publish uh, uh, reports on new release documents. And that report was a very simple meeting between Mr. Asadullah Saraladi, then the deputy head of the Iranian Chamber of Commerce with British uh, mm -hmm. uh, commercial attaché in Tehran in 1981. And in that meeting, they talked about politics, commercial, and different things. And because of that, they, did, they didn't have that, that, the document just based on my brief report. It was about 100, 100 words, I think. Uh, they said he is the uh, enemy spy, and uh, he's, he, he works for British Army. And that gentleman, as of the last few days, nearly 80 years old himself now. Uh, I wrote an article, and I said, then, see, you don't have the documents. I published this. Uh, a report uh, based on that. I then I published a couple of weeks ago a whole document and I showed that was a very simple meeting and everybody in every country, talk, every businessman tried to talk to a commercial attaché in Iran, outside Iran, it's a very simple job to do. But no one listened. They had their own uh, 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 argument. Mr. Asker already denied any meeting, which was obviously lie. And the supporters of Ahmadinejad uh, said he was the enemy and uh, he, he, he was uh, spying for the UK government, which is also another lie. Uh, both of them were lying to each other about, because they didn't want to say they had connection to British uh, officials at all, which was totally nonsense. But they had to talk to each other, the commercial attaché had to talk to business people, businessmen in Europe. Another one was uh, <coughs> the recent arrest of some uh, 16 journalists in Iran uh, based on their connection to uh, BBC Persian service, which uh, still is in prison. And uh, uh, I will talk about the uh, problems of the Iranian government, not current Iranian government, even the Shah's government with BBC Persian service. And it's one of the main problems with the UK Iranian relations. And uh, the, the third one, which uh, was Again, it uh, was uh, an, article, an interview uh, of one of the Iranian uh, uh, scholars who used to live here and now is in Tehran, uh, Mr. Piyuz Moshkez Zadeh, wrote an article, I mean, an, inter uh, an article based on his interview, and he attacked one of the uh, most famous and most popular Iranian uh, uh, historical figure, uh, Mirza Tayyip Khan Amir Kabir, uh, the Prime Minister of Nasser Din Shah about 150 years ago. Uh, he was the icon of Iranian independence, uh, think of, uh, school of thinking and you know, being free from the foreign powers. And he attacked Amir Kabir uh, that, uh, after his uh, uh, removal from the office, he tried to have protection from the British government. And it was obviously, I think it was a lie, and I, I wrote about that as well. So still, be, having any connection to the British policies and British government still Iran is a tabloid. And if you talk to Iranians, many Iranians inside Iran think that uh, the British uh, policy, British government is behind everything in Iran and against Iran. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right, absolutely right. And, uh, if you talk to Iranian opposition abroad, they think, they think that one of the main reasons for the Iranian government to still existing after 34 years is because of the support of the British government. And this is another reason. This is the, so everyone are worried, uh, in Iran is worried about their British policies. Uh, we have a term in Iran called the Ajan Napoleon. Uh, it's a famous novel by Iraj Pezeshzad, uh, Iranian diplomat and writer. 
And this book is the phenomenon, is a, uh, uh, become a phrase in Iranian politics. My uncle Napoleon's book is trans translated to English as well. It's very good. And so everything is. He, yeah. Uh, British uh, are against, uh, are behind everything happening in Iran. This is the Iranian mentality in Iran, outside Iran, pro-government and uh, uh, anti-government. And I can tell you in brief, this uh, uh, approach is totally nonsense based on many, many, many facts. And uh, I cannot say, I mean, this, I, I, I think, uh, I'm, I'm sure the British government likes to think that uh, Iranian uh, think that they are behind everything in Iran, and uh, this is obviously a nonsense. But if you go to the Iranian history in the last 200 days, you can find uh, hundreds of facts about that. I tried to be brief, and I found about 200 for you, but I, I, I wanted to talk about only 50 phrases of the recent Iranian history of uh, British involvement in Iranian history, but I kind, of, I kind of talked about everything. But Dajjal Napoleonism, my, my uncle Napoleonism in Iran, is a very important issue to think about the Iranian attitudes in Iran and outside Iran about the British politics. And that, as uh, Mr. Khatami once uh, said about the US-Iranian relation, I should say, you cannot think about UK-Iranian relation without uh, going back to at least 200 years of history and the uh, building of uh, uh, the wall of mistrust, as Khatami said, uh, between Iran and uh, Western governments. I'm not going to the uh, time before the Constitutional Revolution. You can see the Herat um, saga that uh, Iran lost its uh, control to over Herat and part of Afghanistan, the Reuters uh, saga, and different uh, agreements with the, in the British policy in Iran. But from the 20th century, and uh, finding oil in Iran and establishing the Anglo-Persian oil company and then and after that uh, they changed the name to Anglo-Iranian oil company the British politics in Iran became uh, so uh, direct, more direct and more frank and more obvious to everyone <coughs> I can give you one <coughs> simple sentence for that uh, during the uh, reign of Reza Shah in fact, the Iranians believe, uh, many Iranians believe that both Reza Shah and his son came to power with the help, by the help of the British government. And it's partly true. I mean, I think you can find uh, many facts about both, both of them. Although the British policies towards the uh, Shah and his father wasn't unified, but at least specific uh, factions within the British government helped uh, both uh, uh, monarchs to uh, become the king in Iran in 19... Uh, 25 and 1941. But uh, at the middle of the Reza Shah's reign, the founder of Pahlavi dynasty, you can see the argument between the Shah and the Anglo Iranian oil company uh, about the Iranian share from the oil. And one of the documents that uh, BP published later, it was so strange that uh, shows. The Iranian share uh, during the war and, and a little after the war was uh, almost, uh, I mean, uh, 90 or 80 percent of uh, the, the money that the company paid as a tax to British government. The whole share of Iran was less than the tax the British government, the British comp uh, oil company paid to the British government. The whole share of the Iran from its own oil, and that was the an official figure by BP. Nothing to do with Iranian figures, which was, I think, was much lower than that. Another uh, uh, matter in the UK Iranian relation was always and still is the British policy toward the Persian Gulf. Uh, from the beginning of from the beginning of 19th century, and especially after uh, 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 19th century, 20th century, the British uh, dominance in the Persian Gulf was very important uh, towards the. Iranian regional politics. The main purpose of British pol uh, policy in the Persian Gulf was to reduce the Iranian power in the region. First of all, uh, they tried to uh, uh, remove Iranian ownership uh, to some of the islands, especially the three current uh, disputed islands and Syria. But during the war, during the First World War, and a little after that, the 
official policy of the British government was to buy or have land lease or occupy the all, not of these three or four islands, the all Iranian islands in the, in the Persian Gulf. And that was their, uh, uh, they tried to force the Iranian government, especially under occupation in the First World War in Iran, to uh, agree to selling or land lease of the all Persian Gulf islands in the region and uh, give away some of them, uh, uh, the two, two tombs, Abu Musa and Siri, and uh, the rest uh, to sell to the British government or to have long list like Hong Kong style uh, we had in other parts of the world. Another some, uh, example I can tell you was the action of uh, British consulars in Iran, the Eastern Council consulars in Iran, that uh, they didn't have any connection to the government. They also they all had the connection and negotiation with the uh, people, and uh, they have. Uh, uh, several uh, links and uh, chains of spies in Iran in the 19th and 20th century. And if you like, you can call it the beginning and the, uh, or the, also you can call it uh, the very old school and version of the British public diplomacy in Iran. I mean, uh, diploma, di diplomacy towards people and uh, changing the uh, minds and hearts of Iranian. That was before the era of the public diplomacy in the 1960s, obviously, but if you look at, if you, if you go back, you can see in 19th century and 20th century British had uh, uh, very strong links with Iranians, not governments, but uh, uh, ordinary people, uh, uh, merchants, uh, other people, uh, the clergy uh, and the other uh, clerk people, and every people, and they, 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 they talk to them and they try to influence them towards their own policies. Also, in the commercial way, the Imperial Bank of Persia was at the middle of the 19th century, and every aspect of Iranian uh, financial situation was under control of the British government, the uh, Imperial Bank of Persia, which is the father of this HSBC bank, and uh, the HSBC later married with uh, banking uh, 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 financial groups in um, East Asia and merged with them, and uh, they uh, became uh, the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank Corporation. Uh, the other, in this uh, situation, you see for the first time in Iranian history, uh, at the time of the Iranian Revolution, just after the before the revolution, we can see the word Kolhak, the word called Kolhak, which is still one of the main problems between Iran and the United Kingdom. Kolhak is a garden, is a village, small village in northern Tehran. And in 1906, uh, just before the constitutional Iranian revolution, the Iranian liberals and uh, people who wanted to change the despotism to parliamentarism uh, situation, they took century in uh, British uh, uh, summer uh, residency in Kolhak, and they, they stayed there until the Shah uh, ordered the constitutional constitution and uh, agreed with the establishment of parliament. That garden uh, has a history, and Iranian strongly believed that this, that garden was occupied by the British. Uh, it was a gift. It was a limit, had a limited time, and the British government occupied that. I don't want to go to that because it's a long history of that, and I think uh, it was a gift. It was a, a short. Uh, term gift, but not at the moment. It has uh, every owner ownership documents at the moment, and I think it is a, one, one of the ways of Iranians to show their anger to British policies. And I think the British, uh, the, that garden belongs uh, legally to the uh, British government at the moment. There is no base on this uh, claim at the moment. If, uh, I, I have no time to go to the First World War and the, the occupying Iran and the establishing an official force in Iran called South Persian Rifles, SPR in Iran, Southern Iran, and occupy and officially uh, control everyday life in Iran by British uh, forces in Southern Iran and in Southwestern of Iran. Uh, it so, somehow happened in the Second World War as well. Iran was occupied twice by British government, although it was Iran was. Uh, 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 nothing in the wall, and it was neutral in the war, in both wars, and uh, Iran was occupied illegally, and I think uh, after the war, both uh, Russians and uh, 
uh, British government uh, accepted that uh, the war was illegal, but uh, because of their strategic uh, policies, they had to do that. And that what that occupations uh, led Iranians uh, to hate uh, British policies in Iran. Uh, I have to mention that a uh, few months before the second occupation in 1941, the BBC Service was established, and uh, uh, from that time, Iranian think always. Uh, uh, British uh, policies in Iran uh, somehow comes from the Persian section, and still uh, the Iranian government has problems with that. If you think the problems of uh, Iranian uh, problem with British Persian ser uh, service started after the revolution, you are right, because uh, they had this problem with Shah for many years. And in fact, after the revolution, we never seen the closure of the whole uh, BBC office in Tehran. We had uh, a problem with Persian service, with gold service, but at the Shah's time, once Shah shut down the whole BBC activity in Tehran in 1974, and uh, that was the first and last time that BBC stopped any kind of activities in Iran. And you see, the problem wasn't only after the revolution, it was before the revolution as well for many reasons. And, uh, I don't want to go to Mossad that could time 1953, that is a, a two, three hours talk about the British uh, direct involvement in Iran and uh, toppling the Iranian popular uh, government, uh, perhaps the most popular government in Iran. And uh, Iranians still think the uh, US government was uh, uh, b uh, supporting, the, the, only, the main actor was the UK government in that field. Uh, as you can see, uh, after uh, in the last uh, six months of Mossad that time, which is uh, exactly we are now in the 60th anniversary of that, the new uh, conservative government, government in the UK pursued it, um, the uh, new US government, the uh, uh, Eisenhower government, to uh, follow them to regime change. Because before that, uh, the uh, what, uh, U.S. government didn't want uh, regime change. They thought the oil matter is uh, important, but they didn't think it's uh, important to change uh, uh, Iranian government. The U.K. government, uh, especially MI6 and uh, uh, other factions within the British establishment, um, uh, uh, convinced the uh, U.S. government that uh, it's not only the matter of oil, it's the matter of the Cold War, and Iran is going uh, toward the Soviet Union and they had to do something against Mossad and they, there's no room for negotiation. That was the British policy to convince the uh, US government uh, to not talk to Iran anymore uh, at the time of the uh, nationalization of oil in Iran. The other matter uh, 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 which is uh, the heart of uh, Iranian suspicions uh, toward the British policies was the name of the Persian Gulf. That always in the documents you can see Iranians are angry about uh, British support for uh, the other names of the Persian Gulf or uh, Arabian Gulf or the Gulf, and they all, always the British government in official documents says our of, uh, official policy is using Persian Gulf, and they are lying and lying. You can see different uh, other names they're using, and they try to say we are doing the legal, historical, and official name of the Persian Gulf, but in other documents you see they are lying a lot, and I, I can't. Give you many samples for that. Uh, I'm finishing two, two minutes. Uh, I'm only just uh, go to the, to the titles of the topics uh, I, would, I would like to talk to you. At the time of the after the revolution, the first uh, action was uh, against Iran was from the British government. Uh, three different missions. One of them was obviously planned. A couple of years before the Queen's uh, visit to uh, the Persian Gulf uh, states. Then uh, Margaret Thatcher's visit, then uh, Sandrine uh, Parsons' uh, visit to the Persian Gulf regions was to show the small states in the Persian Gulf that they, they were supporting them against the Iranian government. The three uh, missions, one after each other. Then uh, at the time of U.S. Uh, embassy siege uh, in Tehran, and the British uh, uh, embassy was the uh, main director of uh, U.S. policies in Iran, and uh, <coughs> as, uh, the documents revealed uh, that uh, they were uh, doing everything against Iranian uh, uh, national interests in that uh, matter. 
Also, at the time of the Iranian siege, uh, uh, Iranian embassy siege in London, you can see the doc. The, also, although the British government wasn't behind that, but you can see that they were knew, knew about the nationality of the people who attacked Iran. They, they didn't cooperate with Iranians, and uh, also there are some such uh, some uh, puzzles about killing <coughs> all uh, attackers, uh, even when they surrounded themselves. And uh, there are some other things that uh, still uh, unknown to historians about that. The last thing I want to talk about that, and uh, there are many things to say, is about war. Uh, now, there are about uh, 10,000 documents uh, was have been released uh, about the uh, British policies towards the war, uh, especially uh, uh, helping Saddam Hussein in the war, uh, stopping the Iranian uh, uh, <coughs> already bought and paid uh, uh, equipment to go to Iran. I'll give you one example, uh, perhaps two, or one, one is more important. Uh, Iranians uh, bought a navy vessel called Khark. Uh, it was four. Uh, the British government stopped three of them. They stopped for six years one of them uh, to go to Iran, and they gave to Iran after six years. They, so, they uh, sold chieftain times to Iran in the 1970s. They didn't give it to Iran, they said, because of the US embassy assigned channels because of the US embassy attack, also because of the war, but, but they, they didn't give it to Iran, they already been paid, but they gave those the same tanks to Iraq while Jordan, not only the tanks, the, uh, because the tanks, but uh, the parts for the tanks Iranian captured from Iranians, and also they help, uh, uh, they send, uh, send uh, servicemen to uh, repair them for Iraq, while the whole tanks was for Iran and they paid uh, for more than a decade. And there are many, many samples. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Majid. Obviously, the Iran UK relationship is not only complex but turbulent, as you have quite rightly pointed out. I'm sure it will raise some interesting questions. Finally, um, I would request. Uh, um, our dear good friend who comes here regularly, Dr. Ali Kabani, um, uh, just, just a brief introduction on Dr. Ali. He's a journalist and a political analyst on Middle Eastern Affairs. He was working from 1978 to 81 as a journalist with Al Hawadis magazine, a weekly socio political pan Arab magazine. Um, he's active, he appears on many, many TV channels and he's a regular speaker from this rostrum. Today, uh, Dr. Kabani will talk about the hope from home with the Arab Spring Revolutions. Thank you very much, Dr. I'm not specialist in the Iranian affairs or the Iranian relation with the West, but I will talk as a political observer about the anniversary of the blessed Iranian revolution. The Muslims and Arabs should mark and remember this revolution because it represents an example and a lesson for all the oppressed Muslim people and, in fact, to oppressed people worldwide. The Iranian revolution, in my opinion, is unique and different from other human revolution all over history. Uh, because it had, it, it was not led by uh, a certain social class, nor by a political party with certain ideology, but it was a popular uprising in which people from all classes and different political shades of the Iranian society were members in. And also it was unique because it had a historic and charismatic teacher, political leader, and spiritual imam represented in the late Imam Khomeini Qadazahaba. I'm saying a unique teacher because he prepared his people before the revolution through his speeches, his books, his conferences, his seminars, and let the Iranian Muslim keep his Muslim identity. So 
Although during the Shah's regime, Iran was westernized and going in the line of the West, and the Shah made it a client state to the United States and the West, Imam Khomeini managed to keep the Iranian Muslim identity alive in the hearts of the Iranian people. He was a political leader because he had a vision for Iran to liberate it from an internal dictatorship, but to liberate it also from the control of the Western imperialism and imperial power. He was a spiritual leader because all the Iranian people and after Muslims from all over the world recognized his achievement with the success of the Iranian revolution. This revolution actually was pure popular uprising, peaceful, the first in uh, the area, and it persisted for more than two years until it achieved its goal and the <clears throat> regime fall and Imam Khomeini came back from Paris to uh, his homeland in Iran. And from day one, Imam Khomeini made clear, and the Iranian people made it clear, that a new state was born. This state regained its political, economical, and ideological decision back in its hand. And he challenged the imperial power from day one. That's why the war against the Iranian revolution started again also from day one. Of course, the puppets of the Sheikh Dam of the, of the Gulf and other puppets in the Middle East helped the Western power in trying to uh, delay the development of course, they tried first to abort the revolution or to delay its natural development by the Eight Years' War launched by Saddam Hussein. <coughs> this criminal war actually delayed the national development of the Iranian uh, revolution. And <coughs> the end result was losses on both sides, dead and blood, on both sides, and it uh, was a financial uh, bleeding for the sheikhdoms of the Gulf, because they financed the war of Saddam Hussein. Uh, a lot of people are saying the AK war ended with no uh, victorious and no uh, defeated party. Of course, this is not a political, uh, a proper and correct political analysis, because in my opinion, and the opinion of all independent observers, it is a great success and victory for the Iranian revolution and big defeat of Saddam Hussein, who ended up in the dustbin of history later. But the failure of achieving the goals by destroying and aborting the uh, Iranian revolution and uh, the defeat of Saddam Hussein was obvious in that sense. So, sorry? I'm sorry to disagree with you. I think the only victor... You can disagree with me, of course. But when I finish, I will listen to your disagreement. We don't have an opportunity. We are in a democratic country. <laughs> Everyone has got different point of view, and we can disagree at any time. So, uh, we come to the nuclear fire of Iran. I remember an article written by Michael Portello. He was... Uh, Secretary of Defense at the time of uh, Mrs. Thatcher, and he wrote in the Sunday Times uh, an article which I agree with, and I'm very rarely agree with Michael Portello, but I agree with his analysis in that article. He was saying, in short, why is the noise about the nuclear fire of Iran, and why we are making this noise about the nuclear, the potential nuclear bomb in Tehran? In the West, are we scared from an Islamic bomb? Pakistan has got one. And he mentioned that before Pakistan had a nuclear bomb, during the 30 years before, there was five wars between India and Pakistan. And since Pakistan had the atomic bomb, there was none, no single war. So this is a deterrent uh, weapon which achieved peace rather than war and destruction.
The second thing, we don't want, we, do we want uh, a nuclear free Middle East? To use his words, talk to Israel. So it is not a fear of an uh, Islamic bomb, it's not a fear of a Middle East uh, nuclear free. Uh, also, he said, with a limited number of uh, atomic bombs which Iran can achieve, the West have got thousands of them. And if we could deter the Soviet Union, so certainly we could deter Iran. So he was saying that there is no harm and danger in Iran having even a nuclear weapon, which Iran declared more than enough that this is not their target or ambition. But he, his conclusion was that we can live with a nuclear Iran. So I said to myself, so why are all this war against Iran, the sanctions, the negotiation, it is not the nuclear fight. It is Iran there to break the borders of retardation. They wanted Iran to be a client state, a market for their production, and a puppet on the head of the regime to take their dictates. But when they liberated their political decision, their economic decision, now they are reaching the technological and scientific field, which is a monopoly for the West, this is the main danger. Because that could spread to other Muslim countries or other Arab neighbor countries. So that's why they wanted the sanctions to cripple Iran as they did with Iraq, killing 500,000 people, destroying the economy of Iraq. So they are trying the same policy with Iran. But actually, with the scientific and technological achievement in Iran, we can see that they actually survived all these illegal sanctions, and they are still developing in uh, most of the scientific fields, in the nuclear field, in uh, the military industry. They have their own submarines, they have got aeroplanes, and lately they have got uh, experiments in the space technology. So that is the fear from Iran, and that's why the sanctions and the war against the success of Iran's example. Again, they claim and attack Iran by being a theocratic uh, regime. And of course, in the West, theocracy and religion is a taboo. It is a bad thing, and it destroys any nation. And they forgot that in Islam, we don't have theocratic state and civilian state. We have got a state which conforms with the principles of Islam and doesn't contradict with it. What are those principles? They are universal principles and human principles. Freedom, equality, justice, shura, which is a new concept, but the Western world in their development reached the democracy, which is collective leadership and uh, a collective ruling rather than an autocratic, which could be dictatorship, and we rely on the person himself. If he's a good person, he will be a good ruler. If he's a bad, he will be an autocratic dictator. So this should and the social justice. So I don't think that any two people in the whole world whatever their political ideology, would disagree that these are human values. So a state which applies this are a Muslim state, or a successful state, or a popular state. Uh, we are also uh, talking, for example, about religion. So when we say a Muslim state have to apply justice, actually, God Almighty sent all his messengers and prophets with all the heavenly revelation for a main purpose, in order that justice is applied. So a government or a state which doesn't apply justice is not conforming with and contradicting God's guidance and the human nature and universal values and principles. <laughs> Thank you.
we come to uh, the so-called Arab Spring. I actually call it the Arab Spring with the revolution in, yeah, what is Arab Spring? Arab Spring, so we have winter after, so everything is finishing and all that. It is Islamic awakening, actually, which was sparked by the revolution in Iran, and then a real revolution. And the Iranian revolution, again, is unique. It didn't just change the system of government from autocratic to democracy, from a dictatorship <laughs> to a collective leadership, but it reshaped and reformed a society to, in order to reverse a real Muslim community and real Muslim society. So again, that was one of the things which sparked the uh, danger in the West. So the Muslims and Arabs all over the world saw that example and they followed it because we can see that really the early achievement of the Iranian revolution is that breaking the barrier of fear or the fear phobia by confronting the strongest army in the Middle East with actually the most brutal uh, intelligence uh, establishment which is the Sabak. Every Iranian, I think, knew how brutal this establishment was. So, and it was peaceful more than two years. It proves also the failure of a police state or a military state or a dictatorship to defeat the people, because simply they cannot kill all the people. So that is the lessons which the people in the Arab world saw, lived, and in my opinion, copied. But it, of course it took some time uh, to do that because, as I said, those puppets in the, our area in the Middle East helped the Western powers in trying to defeat and abort the Iranian revolution. First, they said they are exporting the revolution. If you have got a democratic, free society, why are you afraid? We never saw a revolution in a democratic free society. So if this is what you apply in your country, you shouldn't fear the export of the revolution. But actually, there was no exportation of the revolution whatsoever. It was an example for people to follow, and they followed it from their own way. So how can the puppets in the Middle East take off their people from this good example? by saying first, a racial war. The Saddam Hussein war was the Arabs against the Persian. So the intellectual among even those following the puppets and the dictatorship regime, they said that was pre-Islam. <laughs> we cannot say now it's Arab against the per Persians. So they said, okay, so it's Sunni against Shia. So they try to create a strife to prevent the unity among the Muslim people uh, everywhere. Did I exceed my time? So I think I will leave the rest to the uh, questions and answers, but I think, I hope I explained my main message about the Iranian revolution. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. Very kind of you to have stuck to your time. My apologies to cut you in midstream, but I think you got the message across as you quite rightly pointed out. I'll open the floor for q and I know I can see the hands going up very rapidly. We've got about half an hour for Q and A, and I really like to get as many as possible. But please do keep it short questions because I do want to give opportunity to. I saw your hand first. All right, so done. And then I'll come to you and then. Okay. I'll come to you in a minute. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I think everyone knows you. Know. you. <laughs> Look, it's very, very interesting to have the three wise men giving us. As much questions as you know. Right? But let me give you some good news. Thank you very much. Good news. Just uh, today or yesterday, Ahmed Nijab, president of 
Russia, Iran, has arrived in uh, Canada to, to, to be met by President Morsi. And this is the first time since the revolution, you know that. And after that, you went to Russia straight. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> carrying on your life, actually. <laughs> so things have changed. Furthermore, gosh, I'm going to call it for new money. Furthermore, uh, things are much better than you think. Because in spite of the sanctions by the United States, let's not talk about the West, it's the United States, the leader of this world. All right, thank you. Oh, yes. And uh, China, which is uh, coming on to become one of the richest countries, if not the richest, doesn't take a blind bit of notice about the sanctions. Still buying oil and so on. India too has arranged things. Pakistan, which is uh, has the United States uh, glaring at it all the time. They are also buying and selling, and they're going to have this damn pipeline. So things are a lot better than you think. The United States is collapsing, and Iran, fortunately, has all the rest of the Eurasian continent with it. Look, that's enough for me. Thank you very much. I'll take the question. We got the question. That's a comment, I think, to very good. First of all, about the nuclear issue. I truly believe the earlier abandonment of the Imam Khomeini's of the nuclear program was an issue in favor of Iran. And the activating of the issue has served the American interest to use it as a pretext to stifle the progress within Iran and to use it as an excuse to get world opinion against Iran in imposing sanction and consequently the demise of their progress. So the continuation of that program, even if they're successful, is very much an outside dependent technology, which they cannot possibly progress with themselves without the outside help. So it is, in a way, what they're doing, they are simply playing into a political trap which was set by the United States to pursue this policy. And their abandonment of the nuclear program, it will at least free them to go back and develop their own country. The last comment, which I didn't agree with you, what you have said, the Iraq-Iran war, there are no victors. The only victors is a Zionist entity. Neither Iraq nor Iran were victor of that war. It's eight years of war, and the third world country, it was unrepresented. It was the longest war in human history, and it's only served the Zionist entity. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Dr. Muhammad Haider. Um, my question is for a uh, um, couple of questions and a quick comment for David. You know, what is really, I mean, in your opinion, um, the real uh, reason or the fear of the West uh, of Iran having a nuclear power? Um, obviously, it's, it's not uh, just what they claim. You know, it really has about 20% of the nuclear uh, warheads. And uh, nobody is saying anything to them, you know. So I think, you know, there might be other reason. I'm not really, you know, um, announcing it. Um, for Mr. Majid, Dr. Majid, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Uncle Napoleon. Um, I'm just finishing up the last chapter of the book. This is a very interesting book. And really, it shows how, well, I mean, uh, the sense of humor in, uh, in the cultural, uh, in the Iranian culture. But, uh, of course, there is no uh, smoke without fire. Uh, but this is totally justified when you, um, when you understand the, the cultural attitude of the Iranian as a result of the, the colony attitude during Saddam or before and the control of resources. And this is totally justified uh, based on their ex experience with the colonial powers I don't blame them, you know, if they do that, especially if they have um, the evidence against that. And I think, you know, uh, the West must understand that um, Iran is building now a new civilized model in the midst of all these struggles 
where some of the Muslims or Muslim schools are trying to show Islam in a very violent way, which is not true. This is not the true face of Islam. And uh, the West is depriving itself or its people from understanding a very good culture which really may benefit the West in the future, especially in the fail of the democracy these days and its economic principles, because we know that the most, I mean, the failure of the, of the Western model is really uh, leading the whole world to a disaster. And uh, there might be some models can be accepted from such experience and principles. And my last comment, you know, regarding the Arab, uh, uh, the Arab Spring, when this spring is going to finish? Whatever. Could I take the sort of replies from the writer? Well, that's cynical, you know. First, a gentleman actually who disagreed with me, he would be surprised that I agree with his two points 100%. So maybe... He didn't ask about Saddam. Yeah, it was the, maybe the perception of what I said rather than, of course, when two Muslim countries fight, the enemy is the victorious and the Zionist entity. So I agree with you 100%. The other point, when I said that Saddam Hussein was defeated. Failure to achieve your targets and goals, that's a defeat. Like when I say, for example, Hezbollah defeated Israel because they have got certain objectives. It's not that Hezbollah is stronger than Israel, on the contrary. But, for example, the Israeli invasion of uh, Lebanon uh, failed and Israel was defeated because they failed to achieve their objectives. So that was my point. It is not that I want, or I'm supporting one Muslim country against the other. And actually, it is Iraq, and the Iraqi people, and the Muslim people of Iraq, are the main sufferer. As for the Arab Spring, is, you know, people are saying there is, I talk about Egypt because I know it more than the other countries, there is a state, state of chaos in Egypt. But that is an organized chaos and uh, the conspiracy is to create this chaos. For example, the best thing in Egypt would have been to have a transitional government until a parliament is elected, a constitution is approved by the people of Egypt, and then a president come knowing what is his authority, what's his role, and he has got all the establishment around him democratically elected in a free and fair election. But what we saw is a parliament came, dissolved it before a president is elected, a president came and the constitutional court, high constitutional court, is working to abort the Egyptian revolution, in my opinion, and I would argue that even they belong to the old regime by saying because of some irregularities, they dissolve the parliament. The same irregularities happened in Germany and the High Constitution Court said these are irregularities we noticed and we record and it shouldn't be repeated in the next election. But we cannot dissolve, this is the German Constitutional Court, we cannot dissolve a parliament which is freely elected by the German people because the German people are the sovereign. So this Constitutional Court in Egypt forgot who is the sovereign. We saw that they are the sovereign and they dissolved an elected parliament. And when the president recalled that parliament temporarily, they again talk, said that his uh, resolution is not constitutional. The <coughs> contradiction is that the military council actually took the same resolution and the constitutional court did not open its mouth, of course, because they are fearing the military council and military council Tantawi and Anan are part of the old regime. So that is the confusion which they are creating now to abort uh, the uh, revolution in Egypt. The same is happening in uh, Tunisia, for example. You can see the Salafis are <laughs> creating problems and all that. Rather than understanding what is democracy, and people can disagree in the democratic channels, in the parliament, in conferences, seminars, and in the media, 
rather than going in the streets and destroying private and public properties. And again, the main loser are the Egyptian people, and the main gainer and the victorious are the enemy of the Egyptian people, who are the elements of the counter-revolution locally, regionally, and internationally. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> well, it's a, it's, it's a long, yeah, it's a long uh, well, One question that Dr. Haider raised, uh, Dr. Ali, was quite interesting. Is um, Iran offering a new civilized model <coughs> to benefit the West? I think, you know, it requires a whole discussion, but, you know, what's, what's your view on that? In, in my opinion, it is a really example which could be taken anywhere. I always hate the slogans, and I don't believe in it, when we say, for example, Islamic economy, Islamic medicine, Islamic science, there is none, in my opinion, called that. There is science, but the Muslims use it in an Islamic way, which, as I said, conform with their principles and doesn't contradict with it. So in economy, the same. In social theory, is the same. All well, this was formed by the Western banks. None of them. Yeah. It's a new product for them, that's why. This is the thing. That's why, for example, when totally an unentered trade based system was established by Dr. Ahmed al Najjar <coughs> in China, they use that. It's a non Islamic country. So, yeah, what I'm saying is that we should give a good example for Muslims and non Muslims to use. And uh, uh, civilization, science, and technology is universal. It is not uh, a monopoly for a religion or a race. Thank you, sir. Dr. Majid? It's just a, a, a quick answer uh, for the nuclear file of Iran. Of course, from a political point of view, they may have closed this file to deny the Western powers the excuse to attack Iran or do sanctions and all that. But believe me, even if they do that, they will find another reason because this the aim is the WMD of Iraq. They have used it to, to impose sanctions on Iraq. Now they're using the same thing. And when issue. It's an excuse. When they didn't exactly. find it, they said it's a regime change. Even fact. if Iraq didn't have. So if Iran closed that file, they will find another excuse. But also, maybe the leaders in Iran are more principled than me and you because <laughs> I don't agree with you. Uh, sorry. Uh, Dr. Majid, have you got anything to add? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, um, if you could please carry the mic. I think before you start, I think on, on the issue of Iran, just one comment I'd like to make is that the situation between Iran and the West is like if you're traveling on the underground or the bus in London and you look at someone who's a hooligan and he just speaks to you saying, why are you looking at me? You know, that's the situation as far as, far as you know, Iran is concerned. No matter whether it's a nuclear issue or whatever, it's just, why are you looking at me? Sort of syndrome. Please. Uh, I think I mentioned several actions about smoke and fire, uh, uh, some of facts. But uh, I'll give you one story by Ura uh, Iranians. The Iranians uh, uh, have a uh, 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 famous uh, story, they say. It's one. Uh, it was a person that always uh, was uh, complaining that everyone uh, was losing something. Uh, we, lose, we lose something, uh, asking him and uh, blame him to you stole it. He said you stole it, and he was strange. He, was, he said it's very strange. They always uh, uh, blame me, and more strange is they search my house and always find it. <laughs> they they stole it. I think it's the story of Iran and the UK, and uh, the Iranians are blaming the uh, British government for everything, and they have every reason to have these suspicions. I'm not saying it's a good thing, because I think it's being uh, suspicious about British politics in Iran, uh, about everything is not helpful. I was in Iran uh, a few years ago, one of my friends told me, uh, do you know why uh, British uh, uh, media always talks about uh, weather and the forecasting? Uh, I said, Part of the news, he said, no, it's because it's the only only thing in the world they cannot change it. <laughs> this is the Iranian mentality about <laughs> British uh, politics in Iran, and I think that uh, uh, both uh, pro-British uh, people and especially the British establishment love it uh, to have this attitude in Iran. I 
can tell you it was a uh, Prime Minister in 1921, in 1921, Kuhl, Iran says, uh, he, he was very famous for his uh, pro-British attitude. And uh, once someone told me, are you pro-British or uh, made by British? He said, no, I'm son of a famous uh, clergy from Yaz. I'm from Yaz. I was a clergy, I'm a politician, I'm, I was a journalist. And uh, I'm not a British, uh, again, pro-British, but I will kill you if you, if you uh, say yes. Anything against that attitude that I'm pro British because I'm living with this attitude, that I'm, I'm earning from that, and it's very important for me to be famous because of my uh, so called pro British attitude. So, uh, <coughs> one point about the uh, Iran and the UK relation in terms of nuclear activity is before revolution. There are Hundreds of documents and files about the nuclear activities, British nuclear activities in Iran. And I've got a friend, uh, many know him, uh, Dr. Ashbar Etimat, who was the founder of the Iranian nuclear activities at the Shasta, was the deputy prime minister at the Shasta, and he's one of the main supporters of current Iranian nuclear activities now. And he goes to Iran frequently. Uh, and he explained to me that in the British nuclear uh, institutes uh, and the officials virtually begging him and the Iranian government have no cooperation, not only for uh, scientific and uh, administrative job of nuclear activities, but about enrichment of uranium. And they knew some people, not everyone, some people in, within the Iranian region, Iranian Shah Shost, at, at like Iran to have a bomb. But still with that, they try to help Iran to do that. There's a disagreement about that people have different opinions about the real attitude of Shah towards the nuclear activities. But he thinks even uh, the, the British government was open to every cooperation with Iran at, at the Shah's time for nuclear activities. And this uh, current uh, 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 attitude of British government toward Iranian nuclear issue is totally hypocrisy. And you can see that in the documents. Even with the document that has been released in the National Archives, I've seen that in the last six, seven years, you can see that uh, years of cooperation between Iran and the nuclear institutes, uh, British nuclear institutes, and I've seen the documents, and I talked to Dr. Etamad, and you can talk to him, he published his memoirs as well, but is a part of this. Not only the British government, the US government, the French government, Iran part of the, it was shareholder of the nuclear uh, institutes uh, in uh, uh, Eurodif in France, and uh, it was much uh, deeper than we think. Uh, the last thing I want to add is about uh, yeah. it, um, the, the last year attack on uh, British Embassy in Tehran. In Tehran. I, was, I, I didn't have time to talk about that. It was 15 months ago, the British Embassy in Tehran was attacked by some uh, students, so-called students. I think that was very unwise, and uh, uh, it was very bad action by some angry young people in Iran. It was against Iranian national interest, but the reaction of the British government to that was uh, uh, bad as well, and I think uh, it was uh, used as an excuse against Iranian national interest, and I think uh, in long term uh, it must be uh, improved. Uh, and uh, I think after the next few, uh, few months, after the Iranian presidential election, the Iranian uh, the Iran and UK relation has to improve. Thank you. Um, I, any comments? Or? Okay. Uh, James, I'll take you, and then uh, Michelle, and then uh, Reverend afterwards. I'll continue. Thank you very much. Bye. I wanted to ask the all panel really why they haven't mentioned the Holy Land and Palestine in particular, because the revolution, as I saw it, uh, instigated uh, by uh, 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 Tariq Khomeini. Uh, began by he, he began by saying when he was in France uh, that we must uh, deal with this Zion, this cruel Zionist regime that is desecrating the Holy Land and there are many quotes of that sort that is what generated the uh, uh, the problem with the West in inverted commas because countries like us are unfortunately dominated by the friends of Israel mm -hmm. and that's why we seem to be uh, leading or pushing the sanctions on Iran, stopping building, bringing their oil in and stopping them getting nuclear weapons. If you don't keep an eye on that issue, 
uh, I'm afraid you won't get the right answer. Thank you, um, Michelle. Um, can you just get <coughs> Thank you, Lady Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to make a point, please, about the Western model. Now, the Western model, the only example we have in the world at the moment is Iran. That is the Western model, because it, it has continued the classical tradition, which was the Western model. We are no longer the Western model in the West. We are totally occupied Zionism, and we have been since Disraeli who ushered Rothschild in to represent Britons in Parliament. So we have to be very, very careful when we talk about the Western model. I have asked the, the Iranians, please, don't give a propaganda gift to the American propagandists when you shout down with America. Please educate the American public by saying, down with Zionist America, up with Jeffersonian America, because Jeffersonian America is the Western model. Thank you. Can you take the mic to our dear reverend there, please? Um, our speakers have um, um, uh, dwelt a lot on the historical context. Could I ask them to engage for a moment um, briefly in some uh, crystal ball gazing and ask what they estimate with the chances of an imminent um, American, would be an Israeli attack on Iran. President Obama only last year declared that the United States cannot tolerate a newly armed Iran. And um, I know this is difficult because like I myself, uh, some years ago, when Bush was still in power, uh, said to a Muslim audience that Bush was going to attack Iran before the year was out. And, uh, well, thank God I was wrong. So, uh, but I still would like to have an opinion on this. I'll take a final question from David and then we get a to Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, why does the panel think that the uh, representatives of the once mighty British Empire got it so wrong in 1978-79, failed to understand the tide of history, failed to understand what was happening? After all, one, what one expects, perhaps Americans or with, with, in, in deference to Michelle's comment, one expects Zionist Americans to believe their own propaganda. One somehow expects that, 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 that an empire that once bestrode the world and that had had such intimate involvement within Iran itself, that its representatives in 1978 would have been a little bit more wise as to what was going on. And briefly related to that question, does the panel think that the, uh, the, 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 the once mighty British Empire is still living in cloud cuckoo land in relation to Iran and still not realistic about the tide of history. Okay, we can start from this side, David, if you have anything to add to any of the questions. Just in terms of the nuclear file, I don't see, um, I don't see the Israelis striking uh, the Iranian facilities anytime soon. I think there are too many logistical difficulties with it. I think that is, uh, I think that is pretty well known. I think if they were going to do it, they'd die by now. That's my okay. crystal ball gaze. Okay. Palestine or anything? Uh, okay, fine. Can, can I add something? Uh, I'll give you an opportunity, if, if I may, please. Uh, on Israeli lobby, uh, I didn't have time to talk, talk about that. I think the Israeli lobby in the uh, West, especially in the UK, are very strong. Uh, uh, I wrote a very short article recently, a uh, couple of years ago, not recently, about the uh, importance of Israeli lobby in the British politics. Um, I can, it happened two years ago, not, I don't have the current figure. Uh, there are five members of the um, conserva conservative friends of Israel in the parliament. One of them is the British uh, Foreign Secretary, one of them is the, uh, the uh, minister responsible for the Middle East. And only five or five conservative are members of this group. And that, that, that shows how important this, lo this lobby group. And other uh, lobby groups and uh, institutes, institutions, institutions, I've got a uh, uh, newsletter for most of them. You can see every day they talk only on Iran, not, nothing to do with internal politics of Israel, nothing to do with other neighbors, only on Iran, only 
the 80% 90% of our newsletters are on Iran. And they send it to, to me every post, every day in the bus. Uh, six, seven uh, very active uh, Israeli lobby groups in the UK and also in other countries. Uh, the group uh, in the, UK, in the uh, USA called Yani, United Against Nuclear Iran, you can see that um, they talked about uh, attacking Iran every day, they talked about sanctioning Iran, they talked about stopping send, sending Iranian money even for uh, buying uh, coke uh, for Iran, for food for Iran, they said it's against uh, uh, Israeli national interest to send food to Iran, to, to, to send a car parts to Iran, and every day that they talk about that, that there are banners in advertisement in the New York Times and uh, Washington Times and other uh, newspapers. And uh, I didn't have to talk, talk about that, but that are so obvious. Uh, about the revolution, uh, there, I had a chance to read almost every single paper of uh, uh, released uh, official documents on Iran from uh, 70, at least 71 onwards. And uh, you can see uh, after the, in the time of the Sedens right in uh, 1971, uh, uh, when uh, uh, the other British uh, ambassador came to Iran, um, I forgot his name, uh, I'll tell you, but... Uh, Anthony uh, Parsons? Uh, sorry? Sir Anthony no, Parsons. before, between the Dennis Wright and Anthony Parsons was uh, Sir Peter Ramsbottom. Sir Peter Ramsbottom. And if, at, from his time, the Iranian, uh, UK Iran relation was heavily based on arms sales and uh, uh, other commercial things. And they uh, always talk about strong uh, and powerful Shah's situation every time. And uh, when uh, Tony Parsons came to Iran in 1974-5, uh, uh, end of 74, uh, he continues his policies, uh, the Secretary Ram Bottom's policy to write about good things on Iran. Iran. He, they didn't have any connection with the opposition. The only worries was about uh, pro-Soviet opposition. They didn't know anything about religious might. You, you can see they had only one problem, pro-Russian opposition and especially the, the, uh, the armed ones. Not even to the party which wasn't armed, the Cherikai Fadai, the Fadai, Fadai who was the uh, opposition. And a little after that, the so-called Islamic Marxist Mujahideen Khalq NKO, just a little. They don't know anything about the, the importance of religious groups and they thought because of the same feeling against communists, religious groups are the supporters and, co and uh, they, are, they, are, they are helping the Shah. They have no problem with it. Until, when, even Dr. Shariati, when, when he passed away in 1977, uh, in, uh, they didn't know anything about him. Anything. Uh, uh, as Tony Parsons wrote, uh, heard his name for the first time from a British journalist in Iran, a uh, Financial Times reporter. He did, <coughs> Shariati was, uh, was the main uh, important element of uh, Islamic modernism in Iran. Every single student knew him and worshipped him. But they, they, the British embassy didn't know anything. Way they go, they, they, they saw a young mullah. He, they didn't know he's, a, he's, a, he's a one with tie with the suit. He, a young mullah passed away, and Iranian the students were uh, crying for him. They didn't know it, he wasn't a mullah. Uh, that, that was the, the negligence. They focused on Shah. They didn't, they didn't have any thought about the, uh, the weakness of the Shah. And the only problem was communist pro-Russian groups. That was the, my uh, observation about that. Um, about attacking Iran, I think, uh, as uh, my friend said, uh, there is no chance at the moment. I think it's not serious, but it was. if I was in the Iranian government, government I, I took it very seriously. Uh, sorry, please. For the important questions about the issue of Palestine, actually uh, the conflict started by being an Islamic Zionist conflict. And then the Arab rulers reduced it to an Arab Zionist conflict. And then lately they come and say it's a Palestinian uh, Zionist conflict. So every time you narrow the sphere, the series of demands go down. So before we were talking about liberating Palestine, after the defeat of 67, regaining the territories occupied after 67, and then it became a narrow Palestinian, the weak side against the Zionist mighty, 
it is just to have a state, a non-sovereign state, on 20% of historic Palestine, and still the Israelis do not agree. And if you read the book of uh, Gilad Atzman, the Israeli Jewish man, the wandering who, he said that there will never be peace because you have to de-Zionize the Israeli leaders in order to agree to make peace with the Palestinians. Because Zionism means expansion, land grabbing, and ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. So the Arabs and Muslims failed the Palestinians and failed the case. And of course, the Western powers are supporting the Zionist entity to control the area and give the upper hand to Israel. That's why, again, we come to the nuclear uh, issue and the fight of Iran. Israel wants to be the supreme power, the only nuclear power in the area in order to control it. But we can see that the Islamic revolution in Iran came back to make the conflict in its right context an Islamic Zionist conflict <laughs> and it sparked the Islamic resistance in Hezbollah and Hamas and one would notice that Israel never withdrew from a land or territories which it occupies except it did with Egypt with a surrender treaty or a humiliation treaty in which Egypt gained Sinai and lost its sovereignty all over Egypt. But the only withdrew from South Lebanon without a humiliation treaty and from Gaza without a humiliation treaty, that's because of the Islamic resistance supported, financed, and equipped by the Iranian revolution. Thank you very much. The Western model of the Iranian uh, state, of course, it is a modern Islamic state. There is a parliament, there is election. We have seen since the inception of the Islamic Republic of Iran, six different presidents. I remember at the time, uh, President Ahmadinejad were uh, a candidate against Mr. Rafsanjani. All the West powers and politicians, we met with Rafsanjani and we say he is the coming president and all that. Nobody knew Ahmadinejad. But the Iranian electorate voted for Ahmadinejad and brought him to power. Bravo. So this is a free and fair election in which the Iranian people decide it is not even the elite in the Iranian society nor the Western powers who supported Rafsanjani at the time. Speaking of the science, all of the aspects of the classical tradition was carried on by the Persians, where it was in the Middle Ages neglected in the West. So you yeah. took that torch yeah. and you still have it in Iran. Thank you, Michel. Yeah. As, as for the Israeli and Zionist uh, influence and the support in the West, I'm reading actually now uh, a very interesting book by an Algerian philosopher and social thinker, Mr. Malik bin Nabi in which actually he enlightened me and opened my mind. I'm always saying that the Zionist lobbies in the States and in the West, uh, they are uh, influencing the uh, political uh, powers and the political policy towards the Middle East. Mr. Malik bin Nabi actually said that after the destruction of the Solomon Temple in Jerusalem, the Jews left to the East going to Europe. And this actually was coincidental with some Paul coming to spread the teaching of Jesus, peace be upon him, and teach the European, uh, the teaching of uh, Jesus Christ, and bring them from the dark ages to humanity and civility, and enlighten them. So, uh, Mr. Malik the Rebbe is saying that the Jews came 2,000 years ago in Europe, and they became part of its fabric. 
Moreover, they became the brain, the European think with. No, no, no. And we can debate that after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is not me, it's my language now. Sorry, I can change your brain. He says one, one word about it. Uh, it is the brain, the European think with. And the dynamic motivation in which they build their policy. And he gave an example of that the number of politicians in uh, the parliament far exceed ten faults of their proportional number. So, sorry, can we not have debate? <laughs> I, I just want to add one, one thing. Uh, the, the Israeli, the ex-Prime Minister at the Victorian time, came to the House of Commons and he took the Quran in his hand and he said there will be no peace in this world as long as this book is there. And I'd like to say to Mr. Israeli that there will not be imperial power and oppressing of the people as long as this book is there, because that book came with the first pillar of Islam, La ilaha illallah, to liberate people. That there is no power of this universe except God. And you should only fear and obey and worship one mighty which is God. Thank you, Ali. Very kind of just very yeah, 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 quick point about the future uh, you mentioned. I think uh, the uh, next uh, Iranian presidential election is very important uh, towards the Iranian relations, uh, uh, especially for internal politics. And I hope Iranians uh, have uh, someone better than Mr. Ahmadinejad in power and future. They can have no one okay. better. <laughs> Thank you very much, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> <laughs> My friend, the Reverend, in two sentences, actually. Israel will not have a military strike against Iran because Israel does and never threaten. When they talk about something, they don't do it. If they want to attack, they would have done it without talking about it. Thank you. Thank As for the Americans, Obama declared that the decade of wars is finished and his battle now is the economy and rebuilding the economy of the states. I'm afraid uh, I really need to complete the session this evening. Very kind of you, our guest. Please do thank them in a warm manner. And of course, the audience coming here on this cold evening. I've got a number of announcements to make. I'll take uh, not too much of your time, but really, to conclude the program this evening, it's good to remember Allama Iqbal Lahori again. He says, our lives are sustained by the ideals we create for ourselves. Our being is illuminated by the rays of our aspirations. So really, the revolution is an aspiration to not only the Muslims, but I think to all the oppressed people that Dr. Ali quite rightly pointed out. Uh, next week, there's a whole host of programs taking place concerning the, uh, what is now dubbed as the Pearl Revolution. I didn't know that it, uh, the situation in Bahrain was dubbed the Pearl Revolution. Anyway, next week there are programs. Uh, the first one is tomorrow evening um, at um, King's College. And then there's a program at Parliament and press conferences and so on. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have received emails about this. Uh, but there is uh, leaflets um, uh, just uh, at the back. So please do take them and, and come and join um, the people who will be taking part in these programs. I think they're quite important and um, quite a sort of you know, useful process will be achieved by attending these programs. Um, and once again, thank you very much, all of you. Inshallah, look forward to seeing you next time here. Please join us for me downstairs.